All right. Welcome this afternoon, everyone, to our uh, Ed Rollo study skills session. I'm excited to have you with us today. I know um, many of you are going to have trial exams coming up in the very near future. And so we're really hoping today's session is going to be a real help for you as you prepare for those. So my name is Lyndon. I work for Ed Rollo. I used to be a chemistry teacher. I've had a number of classes go through the HSC before. Um, and uh, now I yeah, support students and teachers across uh, the country really to help use Ed Rollo effectively and help support their studies. Um, so I'm not going to be the one presenting this afternoon though because we have um, Zoe with us today. Zoe's recently completed year 12 um, and she is our performance coach for year 12 students. Um, she also goes to uni and uh, is helping us write our year 7 and 8 math textbooks at the moment and um, she's going to cover a lot during this session and so I encourage you to grab a pen, take some notes, but we'll also be sending out the recording for this session um, afterwards as well. So you can go back and uh, cover anything that you may have missed. Um, we also have on the call here, uh, Jack and Inga, two of my colleagues, they'll be on the chat box. Um, so if anything comes up or you've got questions as we're going through, please use the Q&A function. Um, that'll ensure we can get to all of those questions. So they might answer any that they can on the spot. Otherwise, and we'll save a bunch. We're going to have uh, 10 minutes at the end to do some Q&A um, and yeah, answer any questions that you guys might have that have come up during the session. Um, so yeah, use that Q&A function as you please. Now, Zoe, are you there with us? Is um, you able to jump on there? Yeah, welcome. Hello. Hi, Zoe, welcome. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Zoe. I'll jump back in at the end to help with some of the Q&A uh, that comes through. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today, Zoe. I know these uh, guys here on the call are going to get a lot of value from what you've got to share. So I might hand it over to you. Okay, let me just change slide. Thanks for that introduction, Lyndon. Um, before I talk a little bit about myself, I thought I'd get right into what I hope you'll get out of today. To start off, we're going to learn how to memorize information quickly over long periods of time using very not intuitive, but effective techniques. We'll learn how to deeply understand content faster using structural priming. And we'll also look at effective ways me and my students kick procrastination, stay motivated and wisely use our time. It's a mix of stuff that worked for us and tips that leverage scientific research. Now, I only have half an hour, so you may need to go ahead and research these concepts a little on your own. I'll give you some suggested resources at the end to do that. We'll conclude with a 10 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions, please write them down during the session to ask at the end. I'm also here to show you how we can enact these techniques using a drollo. Typically, I don't like plugs myself, but a drollo really is that good. But first, a bit of background about me. I'm from Victoria and I graduated in 2020 with an ATAR of 99.45. I mainly did maths and science subjects, but my best result was in a linguistic subject called English language. This is a lot like a mesh between English and humanities subjects in your states. Now I'm studying English, sorry, I'm studying teaching at Monash, doing year 12 performance coaching and tutoring, and I'm working on maths textbooks at Edgerollo. So I got my ATAR in what was a pretty tough year for me personally. Yes, there were COVID lockdowns, but I also had my grandmother who I lived with become really sick and need more intensive care. So believe me, I am well aware that there is more to year 12 than study and that things can and do go horribly wrong. Ultimately, what got me through was managing my time and my head to get stuff done and remain motivated, as well as working smart using research-backed study techniques. This is a major reason that I do year 12 performance coaching now. Outside of my work and study, I find balance through my friends and family and boring dancing. I really encourage you to find your thing and make sure that there's more to your life than work. But on to business people. I am hoping that you're here because you're realizing that you want to get better results than you currently are. So you're open to different ways of doing things. But I still thought that this would be a timely reminder. What I'm sharing today is, I dare say, different to what you're already doing. But basically, if you want to change your marks, you're going to need to change your strategy. Let's start with how we memorize stuff. Now, memorization in and of itself is not sufficient. After all, you should never memorize anything you do not fully understand. However, memorization is still super important. 
Why? Because it frees up brain space for other things in the middle of your exam. Take, for instance, your English exam essay, where you have to use quotes from the book. Struggling to remember a quote that you sort of half remember not only wastes valuable time, but it also means that your brain is so occupied with trying to remember something that it is not thinking critically about the prompt, it's not remembering your mental plan, and it's certainly not checking your written expression. This is the precise reason our maths teachers make us memorize times tables and key number facts. Maths is plenty hard enough without having to figure out eight times six manually each time. Also, the rote memorization of information like definitions reduces the margin of error if you're asked to supply these in the middle of an exam. So, like most people, I began my learning to study journey with making summaries in my own words that were personalized to me. I would then rewrite a more condensed version of this summary and then yet another more condensed version of that summary. I did this to ensure it was active learning. I thought this made it automatically supremely effective. In reality, this was a fun activity for a stationary fiend. I rewarded myself with Tombow calligraphy pens, mild liner highlighters and Muji gel pens. Then I congratulated myself for actually being productive. In the early days, I was operating under the delusion that not only was I understanding and retaining the information, but the more pages in my summary, the more tangible proof of how productive I'd been. But we should not measure productivity by the page. When I was looking at my outcomes and started digging a bit deeper into the research, I came to realize that summaries were the sugar of my studying diet, not entirely without sustenance, but certainly not the healthiest food we could have having. So here is something that is unfortunately true. We are terrible at objectively judging what study methods are best for us. The hardest way to learn actually feels easy and the easiest way to learn feels hard. This sounds very unintuitive, especially given the often given but scientifically debunked advice that we should see what study method works best for us and it should fit in with our own personal learning style. The reality is this. Good study techniques force our brains to build connections. This encodes information more strongly, this resulting in more reliable and faster recall. The process of forcing these connections feels hard. Now, bodybuilders know it's at the point when lifting weights starts to feel difficult that real muscle development begins. So let your mental resistance to a certain approach be a guide. If you don't want to do it, chances are you're probably on the right track. This is why open book note taking has limited effectiveness for memory. When researchers compare study methods, it falls around middle of the pack. And that is for people who have been formally trained in the art of summarizing after years at uni. This is not the typical high school student. It's certainly more effective than rereading or highlighting, but considering how much time goes into a summary, there are much more efficient and effective things we can be doing with our time. So our brains are tricked into feeling we need copious amounts of sugar, but the food which is best for us is often bitter. The Kale of study is self-testing. And then we season this with spreading out that self-testing over time. And then we cook it in deep understanding. Okay, I know I'm getting a bit carried away with the metaphor, but stick with me here. The proper name for self-testing is active recall. You may have heard of active versus passive learning. This is pretty much as active as it gets. Flashcards, tests at school, any time you have had to remember any information without looking at notes. These are all variants of active recall. It is the single most effective study principle ever discovered, as demonstrated by a mountain of research. Why does it work? The way the brain makes long-term connections is based around how much you retrieve information from your brain. We all have this misconception that in order to study, we have to put stuff into our brains, but actually it's flipped on its head if you look at the neuroscience. Looking at the evidence, the actual way to remember and learn anything long-term is to retrieve information from our brains rather than these relatively doomed attempts to put it back in through summaries or something else. Then we supervise, did I just say supervise? <laughs> I meant to say supercharge. Well, we supercharge this active recall process by doing it again and again repeatedly over time, but we do it at very specific intervals in a process known as spaced repetition. A lot of people who cram a few weeks away from the exam will revise the same information many more times than is shown in this graph. 
but these people actually recall the information more poorly than people who review the same information less by space it out more over time. Again, not very, un not very intuitive. So why does it work? It can be explained by something known as forgetting curve, which maybe some of you have covered in psychology or a similar subject. It's really well established in the psychology literature for like 100 years. The forgetting curve is basically the idea that over time we forget things at an exponential rate, if we have no intervention, that is. The way we can take advantage of the forgetting curve is through breaking the cycle by reviewing material at spaced intervals. In essence, the idea behind spaced repetition is that you allow your brain to forget a little bit of the information. This makes the active recall process hard. Remember that I said the most effective learning feels hard because that is when it's the most active. To reiterate, the harder we make our brain work through spaced repetition, the more likely we are going to encode the information strongly. The easiest and cheapest way to implement this, in my view, is to put the content you need to remember into this app called Anki. It's really just a free tool on your laptop. You just go on the web, download it, it's two minutes of your life. Now, you can pay a lot of money to have it on a tablet or a phone, but the desktop version is literally the same. All you have to do is open the app every day and it will spaced rep your content for you, taking into account how well you remember stuff. Basically, it makes active recall and spaced repetition idiot proof. I highly recommend this. Honestly, if you have a Drollo, exam packs from Nessa and Enki, you have got pretty much all you need to nail HSC. I can't give you a demo now, but there are tons of excellent ones on YouTube. And pro tip, the best ones are almost always by medical students. So memorization is all well and good, but it is nowhere near as important as deeply understanding the material. Never, ever memorize something without understanding it first. Now, the most efficient way in my view to acquire a deep understanding of most content is not through summary making, but a combination of pre-study called structural priming and then learning the content in layers. Hopefully you've been through most of the content already with your school and now you're just kind of filling in gaps and getting ready for your trials. You still can reap the benefits of pre-study though as the first step in your revision. Okay, structural priming. Essentially, the idea is you're building a hierarchy of information while creating relationships across broad ideas and key themes in your syllabus. So this is basically looking at the syllabus and then breaking down the information to provide a structure. You can then work from this structure systematically. Textbooks do this a little bit, but I recommend using a visual aid like a tree diagram or a mind map or maybe a digital tool. Personally, I used Notion and that worked super well for me. Categorization breaks down the material instead of learning it as one large chunk. You could visualize this body of knowledge as a tree with every branch extending into smaller branches and subpoints. What you're doing essentially is priming your brain to build relationships faster since you have a broad overview of the content and the ideas that you're going to be covering. And ultimately, a lot of what you're assessed on comes from a deep understanding of those relationships. Importantly, it's going to be super helpful in identifying the high yield information, which is something I'll get into a little bit later. In addition, you're going to have improved recall of the information as a result of the structure. Essentially, it's the difference between you trying to find a particular shirt in a massive pile of all your clothes and finding it in a well-organized closet. You'll find the shirt faster, right? Likewise, you'll find whatever piece of information you're looking for. A point I want to drive home here, though, is that pre-study like this should not be a massive use of your time. Basically, you shouldn't be learning any nitty-gritty details of the subject yet. Structural priming ideally takes place before you learn the material, although maybe for you guys, it's just going to be before you embark on any further revision. This technique has saved myself, my students, and my friends doing courses like medicine 10 to 20 hours easily. Um, unfortunately, I don't have capacity to go into structural priming anymore, but if you are interested in, depth, in that technique, this is a really great video from Archer Newton that you'll get after the session, which goes into it in a lot of detail. He's a 99.95 scorer from South Australia. 
Oh, it's got playing. Okay, I escaped that. So, okay, my next point, after we've got our hierarchy of information, then we should proceed as if we are learning in layers. So this is going to look different for different people. Personally, I had taught myself all of the content for all of my subjects by semester two, and then I treated my lessons after that as revision lectures. But some people are also going to be really pressed for time and they can't even do this many layers. This is just a sample structure and to give you some inspiration for your own system. The point is what you do need to have is a logical process you follow for understanding everything in your course. And between stages, you know what your questions are and attempt to answer them in the next layer at the process. Otherwise, there is no point going through this many layers to understand a single concept. The reason I love Adrolo so much though, as a student and now as somebody working for them, is that is an amazingly useful resource at every one of these stages. If you do end up doing that, a useful strategy can be to make a note of which bits of information are still confusing so that when you chat to a teacher, you know exactly what your question is. So never ever let a question slide. So here are some tools that you can use in the Adrolo platform. It could also be post-it notes in a textbook, but never let a question slide. Now, is a drollo a magic bullet? Of course not. But what it is, is essentially free for you since your school pays for it. It is also a syllabus aligned product and provides comprehensive alternative explanations to your own teachers. This means you don't need to invest in tutors and stuff like that. That combined with practice exam questions, video solutions and marking schemes, and pretty intuitive features will give you all the tools you need to succeed. Having a core, a core resource as opposed to like a ton of study guides saves you time in reading subpar material to try and get a concept. This means that you can move on to the main business of exam prep a lot faster. After all, I am not saying that you do not need an information source. Of course, you need to sit down, figure out what to memorize and have that recorded somewhere, ideally on Enki flashcards. What I am saying is that that compilation process should be done as quickly as possible. It is there to tell you what to memorize. And here is how I go about it using a drawer. So I tell all of my students to prioritize the stuff they memorize based on two key characteristics. Number one, what is explicitly identified on the syllabus? So not tangential points that help you understand syllabus things. So things like case studies are worth hearing when you're learning the content because it helps you understand it and put it in a new context. But ultimately, you do not need that stuff memorized for an exam, especially when you're pressed for time, as most of us are. Number two, we need to say what comes up a lot. You can find this out by checking out the marking guides at earliest opportunity. So one of the first things I get my students to do in like February, ideally, is go to the marking guidelines and past exams and gather approved definitions and explanations from the guidelines to memorize, word for word on Anki. Now, in the middle of an exam, you may need to modify these slightly to take into account the question, but ultimately, it frees your brain space to be thinking critically about your exam rather than trying to get your wording right to meet the criteria. It also means that you have got the high frequency concepts solid in your memory. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you should neglect the whole syllabus. Adrolo gives you study notes aligned to the syllabus ready for your exams. Once you've understood stuff and you're ready to get to the memorizing part, get the bits that line up with the dot points, make an Enki flesh card, and get cracking. So these are all the subjects that we have Adrolo courses for in the HSC. If you do one of these and don't have Adrolo for it, ask your teachers to get in touch with us and we can set up a free trial for your class. Okay, so um, now for a bit of a change, hopefully this is a bit less intense. Let's talk about motivation, time management and procrastination. So here are two of the major problems I see. Overscheduling, which is taking on too much in the time frame and procrastination. Certainly they're related. Overscheduling leads to feelings of, I can't do this, it's not worth it, I am going to do something fun, and therefore procrastination. 
procrastination means we have more stuff to do in less time. So that leads to overscheduling. The resolution to both of these problems is quite similar. So here are some time management fixes. Schedule study last. So after school hobbies, time with friends, um, I don't know, school leadership responsibilities, part-time work, all of those things would go in your outline for the week first. This means that you will have a realistic idea of how much study you're going to do. If you end up not doing something else that is less important, more time for study, great, but don't plan on it. When you're scheduling, I would recommend against making task-based to-do lists. Believe me when I say everything takes longer than you think and all you can commit to is spending time on something, not actually completing it. I had to move away from daily to-do lists, which were for me a recipe for unfulfilled expectations and disappointment. And instead I moved towards time blocking and systems. Put it this way, it's better to say, I will spend one hour revising for my physics test than to assume I could complete a set of questions in that time. But honestly, what's really better than any of that time management stuff for me personally is considering my priorities, which helps both overscheduling and procrastination. The most important way I did this was called the one thing principle. It's actually very simple. So when you have your morning coffee, you just ask yourself, what is the one thing I can do today that is going to have the most impact on your, my ATAR? Then just make that happen as soon as you can. There is other advice out there that says you should start with something simple to gain momentum, like maybe note taking or easy homework. There is some merit to that and that may work for you. But oftentimes I found I worked all day and gained very little. So the one thing principle helped me keep frustration in check. It identified areas that required more work and it built confidence that I would be ready for my final exams because I was doing one impactful thing every day. So I kind of took inspiration here from the pay yourself first principle in investing, which is where you put money away into long-term savings before you do anything else with your money like bills. In year 12, the best forms of long-term saving are getting ahead and practice exams. So I got up early to study and do practice exams every day, even if there was an internal assessment task. And you know what? Some days, maybe the best thing you can do for your ATAR is take a day off because you're exhausted. That's okay. This lets you do what you need to do for your mental health and life without guilt. So how do we know what one thing to do though? Now we have some awareness of the best techniques to use and where they fit in the study process. You can use that knowledge to get bang for buck. If you're still working through content though, one of the best things you can do, actually probably the best thing you can do is target your areas of weakness. An old but good technique is self-rating. You can use a traffic light system on your syllabus like this one or a Drollo self-rating tool, which has the added bonus of being visible to your teachers. So you're giving yourself and your teacher data. You can also see all your ratings very nicely on your study planner. And it's good that you're prompted to check in with yourself every time you do content with a Drollo. So how am I going for time? I think I'm doing well. Um, one piece of the puzzle left though is procrastination. Motivation on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, pretty much everything I say here is better presented by the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Pink in his TED talk. Please check this out in your own time. It is amazing. Still, I'm going to go through some of the key parts here for you and some HSC related applications. So broadly speaking, we have two main types of motivation. Internal motivation is stuff like, I'm studying physics because I love physics and I want to learn more. External motivation is stuff like, I'm studying to get a good ATAR and not going any further. No prizes for guessing that internal motivation trumps external motivation most of the time. So internal motivation breaks down into three key parts according to Pink. We have autonomy, which is the need to self-direct and not be imposed upon. Sometimes we don't like doing things we have to do, like homework our teacher assigns us. But when we reframe something like that as a personal choice, we take back our autonomy. So I have a short script here for when you feel like procrastinating. 
I don't have to do this. It's my choice. Am I going to choose to do it? Next is mastery. This is one of the big ones for me personally as a student and also explains why we tend to like things that we're good at. We already feel as though we're making progress, that we're doing better and we want to keep on getting better. So we continue to feel good about ourselves. We may also have developed a love for what we're doing and we just want to do something that fascinates us. But we can still leverage mastery even if we're not good at something yet by believing that we are using effective techniques which guarantee that we will improve every time we study. So another short script is here. If I proceed with the study session, I know for a fact that I'm going to improve. Am I willing to forego that improvement? Finally, we have purpose. And this one far outstrips the other two as being the most effective internal motivator. I've written it down as the ability to connect to a larger clause. But for me, it was about finding my deeper why and connecting everything I do to that. Maybe you can't do this yet because you're still figuring that out, which is totally normal. In that case, you will need to rely more strongly on the other two. But if you do have that deeper why and you do have that sense of purpose, then that is an incredible thing to leverage. So I turn that into the script, I am doing this because, where you end that sentence not with because my teacher told me to, but because in my case, I want to be the best teacher I can be and I want to learn all of the powerful knowledge I can so I can share that with my students. Maybe it's climate scientist or something else for you. I don't know. When you feel yourself going off task, go through these three scripts, write them down and put them on your wall if that works for you. So after going through all of that, see how appealing that YouTube video looks. One last thing on procrastination though, it's never just one TikTok or Instagram post or YouTube video. Here's a quick story. My family friend Pam quit smoking. How did she do it? She said to herself one day, fine, fine Pam, buy that cigarette. But it's not just one cigarette, it's a whole packet. And she might not have been able to say no before to that one cigarette, but say no to a whole packet, much, much easier. Now, I am not equating TikTok and smoking, but what I am saying is that every time you want to go off task and open an app, you are effectively kissing the next two hours goodbye. Suddenly, it's much easier to say, I am not willing to do that. Okay, so before I start wrapping up, I just want to say that all of the stuff is well and good and important, but ultimately, unless you're struggling, most of your time between now and the exam should be spent on exam style questions. If you're wanting a high mark, you will need to do a ton of practice questions. Get them from a drollo, past exams, teachers, study guides, whatever. But basically, the more of these you do, the better your mark is going to be. I can't go too much into this now, though, because that's going to be next session's topic. OK, so let me just wrap up with this. It's pretty likely that you've heard about fixed versus growth mindsets. If that resonates with you, fantastic. If it doesn't, think of it this way. Ultimately, what cognitive science and neuroscience tell us is that we have much more in common with each other and the smartest person in the class than we don't. We have the same cognitive architecture of working memory, long-term memory, and similar abilities to handle new pieces of information at once. We also pretty much think about things the same way, which is why theories like learning styles or visual kinesthetic, et cetera, were debunked pretty brutally. You are not limited by your current abilities. Your ability to learn and retain information is instead really malleable. Basically, it's all about how you leverage your brain and how it works rather than your innate IQ. Similarly, if you're working part-time or something has gone wrong in your home situation like it did for me and you're losing hours each day to public transport, you're definitely going to have less time than some other students you're competing against. But again, what you do with the time you have left. If it's the most effective high yield study practices that are out there and you're using your time with your teachers effectively, in all likelihood, you can do just as well, if not better than someone who's basically studying full time with less effective techniques. My point is whatever the challenge you have identified in your own life is, there is a way forward. So, 
just some stuff to expect next time, exam technique, getting the most out of your practice questions, which are the key to you doing well. And as well, minimizing the time you actually do need to practice by being smart about our analysis of the stuff we get wrong. So I'm aware that I couldn't go too much in depth about a lot of the techniques I cover today. So here are some really good resources for learning more about that if you're interested. Ali Abdal, my personal favorite YouTube channel, Archer Newton, I showed you a video of his earlier. Also the Make It Stick book, which is probably one of my favorite books of all time, which shows the studies, everything super, super well. I don't think we have time for a biggest takeaway. And I think that we're about onto our Q&A, aren't we? Yeah, I think it's Q&A time. Um, so yeah, let's jump into that. And um, while we'll give you a moment to put through any questions, so there's so much gold in what Zoe has shared. And thank you so much, um, Zoe, for doing that and running us through all those things. There's a lot in there. And so if there's particular things you want to understand a bit more or questions you want to ask, um, let's give you a second now to put in, use the Q&A um, box rather than the chat box, use the Q&A function there in Zoom and put those questions through and either Zoe or myself will uh, work through those. And while we give people a chance to do that, Zoe, there's someone just coming and asked if you can go back to the slide on motivation, the autonomy and purpose. Um, and they just want to have a quick look at that again. And Sorry, um, I missed that, Lyndon. Um, back to the slide on autonomy and purpose, motivation slide. Sure. Um, they're keen to screenshot that. Now we will send through the recording of this and we'll send through some of those links um, and the slides as well. So this will come through, but if you're wanting to look at this straight away, we'll leave that up there. And to you. the people who want to look at the slide, definitely recommend you check out that TED Talk right after because um, Pink really expressed that so much better than I ever could. All right, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, so if you're wanting to add yours in there, please do so now. Um, um, all right, so I might answer the first one here and then Zoe, you can take the next one. So the question right. came through here was, are there any past papers on Ed Rollo? So you spoke about um, using past papers, Zoe, and practice questions and they're trying to turn through a whole lot of those as a really effective way. Um, so you mentioned there will be a second session. So towards the end of this term, the lead up to your HSC exams, we're gonna be running a second series, which really focus on those practice exams and how to prepare and develop those examination skills. So that'll be coming up, um, but we know you do have exams before that, your trials. So if you're looking for um, past papers on Ed Rollo, those are divided up into the progress checks and topic tests that you will see built throughout. They're hyperlinked in a blue color throughout your, um, your study planner course overview in your Adrolo account. Um, so every one of those questions, they've got an experienced HSC teacher walking you through the marking guidelines, giving you tips and tricks and really helping you develop that exam skill as well. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't wait until your HSC exams get into those and be doing them now. Okay. Yep, hundred percent agree with everything Lyndon said. The sooner you can get onto it, the better. Um, if you're feeling ready, one thing I would suggest is potentially trying those to time. It can be really intimidating going to a full trial exam immediately. I totally get that. But one of the really great things about Edrollo is they give you marking guidelines and a mark allocation. So, yeah. You can definitely multiply that by the minutes per mark and have a go at answering that to time if you feel that you're ready for that. Um, okay, so Oliver, what is the best way to learn and understand bigger concepts that are tough to fit on the palm card? For example, the process of pregnancy and stuff involved are way big, too big to fit on one palm card. Okay, um, really great question. The first thing I would say is I wouldn't recommend putting that on one palm card, at least to start with. So um, pregnancy is something I'm not that familiar with. So I'll try and think of another process, maybe natural selection or something like that in biology. So I would break it down into the phases and I would make a bunch of questions. 
So what is the definition of natural selection? What are the phases of natural selection? Um, what is the process? So I hope that you kind of get what I mean, just breaking it down into smaller parts. And as you become more familiar with those, you can condense it onto, um, yeah, onto a single flashcard. And eventually you can ask yourself, like, explain the whole process of pr pregnancy and you'll be so familiar with that content, you'll totally be able to do that. Yeah, I hope so that answers saying, your question, Oliver. Are you saying, Zoe, like if there were, say, four stages to natural selection, you would go, so one flashcard might have, what are the stages in natural selection? And you have the four of yeah. those. And then you might have another flashcard with the first stage, mutation. If it was a huge thing, that's how that. I'd go about it, for sure. Yeah, because right. what that does is it isolates the points that you're not remembering. For example, if you have pregnancy and there's like one sentence you don't remember or of something that would be like four paragraphs long, I don't know, then it's kind of unfair to say, I don't remember the whole thing when you're not remembering a single fact. But as you start to associate that stuff together, then it may make sense to test yourself on, can I recall all four paragraphs at once? Hmm. Yeah, great. And that's so just a simple matter that. of cut and paste on Anki. Yeah, fantastic. And um, there's a couple ones here just asking about the second webinar. Um, are we automatically signed up to that? Um, you'll get, just like you did with this one, an email with that link when that's available. And um, so you will need to register for that one separately. Um, and there's a couple here about, can you go back to uh, the understanding content slide? Um, what was point six on the understanding content slide? Um, and then once you've done that, so Zoe, can you jump back to that one? Yeah, um, um, by all means. So, um, by the way, if you're that student, feel free to shout out if you're, if I am on the wrong slide or something. So understanding um, content. So yeah, I'm assuming you mean something that one, like. I think. Yeah, the learning layers. That's the point six on this slide. So yeah, you can leave that up for a second. Yeah, um, by all means. Um, cool. If you could just read me another question, Lyndon, I could like answer that while that person does a snip. Yeah, so this question, I can start with this one and you can add anything extra. Perfect. But a student's asked, um, if I've failed to keep up with schoolwork um, and understanding the key concepts, what must I do? So let's say exams are a few weeks out and I haven't been applying myself um, as well as I could have throughout the year and I've got gaps in my understanding. What's the best way to go about that? Um, I guess my thought would be, you know, using your syllabus as that Bible of these are the things I need to be able to know and do. So whether it's be doing that traffic light system and going through um, and going, okay, I was here for these lessons. I understand this. It's green. Or I wasn't here for that. I have no idea about these dot points. Red. All right. So if you've got those or if you're doing that on Edrola using the self-rating and then going back and revising, you've got Edrola's videos there with an experienced teacher explaining those concepts as the syllabus prescribes. So you can be filling in those gaps um, based upon those, yeah, the highlighting or the noting of the fives or the, uh, sorry, the ones or the reds um, and filling in those gaps um, first. Because if you don't understand the content, then it's very hard to commit it to memory if you haven't actually learned it in the first place. Um, do you have anything to add there, Zoe? I think that all of those are excellent points. And um, I, yeah, completely agree with that. I would add that you are in a really great position. Like, is it's kind of hard to consider your position an advantage. One of the advantages you do have is that you can derive most benefit, the most benefit from something like structural priming. If you do that, it will save you a lot of time when you're trying to learn this stuff. So I would say, like, for each of your subjects, one to two hours, go through, do that structural priming, write it down and have that and then I would go through so yeah then I would go through your identified areas of weakness so Lyndon said go through and traffic light it yep great system do that um yeah and in terms of memorization if you've got time after you've been through content I would advise you to focus largely on the stuff that was in the marking guidelines so um, I talked about going through and memorizing stuff that's come up in the past. A lot of times exams borrow the same concepts and material from previous exams. 
So that is the best thing you can do in terms of having information committed to memory that is usable. Will it be enough for your final exams? No, but it's a good start for sure. Um, there's another question here about um, a student that saw a lot of improvement in their first few practice tests they did and using that process, um, but now they're not seeing so much improvement each paper they're doing after they did those first few. And um, they're asking if you have any quick tips on what to do next. Is it worth persevering with practice papers and doing practice tests to keep refining that? Or is there different strategies they should try to include in there? Okay, um, I don't have a lot of detail in that. First of all, fantastic question. Second of all, I don't have a lot of detail in that. So my advice would be a bit tailored to what kind of level you seem to be stuck at. Um, I have students who are stuck at like really high levels. And if not, you don't really have that much of a problem. Otherwise, I would say, why are you, what questions are you getting wrong and why? Which is a lot of what my next session will focus on. So what content, what concepts am I getting wrong the most? Why am I losing marks? Talking to your teacher maybe and seeing, like I can see that my answer doesn't quite line up with what they've done but without using their precise wording in this company paper, I don't know how I would take myself to that level. So, yeah, I would advise you to start dedicating more of your time to doing a bit of an autopsy of the past exams, especially the ones that you found difficult. Yeah, because there's one thing in you attempting questions and the practice of applying your knowledge, but there's the other thing in self-reflecting and understanding how did I go? Where did I go wrong? How can I improve? Um, and yeah, using what you've written to, to improve on that in that self-reflection phase rather than just the applying the knowledge phase. Um, so yeah, if you're not doing much of that reflection, maybe that's an area to focus on as well. Um, and when you cause you said doing an autopsy, so doing an autopsy on your own responses as well. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. So um, I see that one person said, any tips on how can I summarize physics and chemistry concepts onto palm cards? Because I am afraid of missing important content if I condense it too much. Yeah, I understand that fear completely, but you also don't want to be drowning in content because ultimately it's going to be the same few principles that'll make up like 80% of your exam questions. So um, I, I would recommend focusing on high yield information, like I said before, stuff that comes up a lot and also what directly answers your syllabus points. For example, if the point is like, what is natural selection or can explain natural selection, then you should have an Anki flashcard all about explaining natural selection. I don't know why I'm focusing on biology so much, it just worked out that way. Um, for physics and chemistry as well, I would be more mindful of doing past papers especially if you're kind of at that stage because that will also tell you what's important if you've got a flashcard that you're like this is sort of on the syllabus it's sort of not and you've done 40 practice papers and it hasn't come up once maybe it's not that important so in that way hopefully you can prioritize information there as well um yeah anything to add to that Linton? yeah no that that's great and um just making sure people have actually had a look at some of those um the marking feedback that appears on every exam paper that's written and that's sort of yes. what you're talking about that high yield information looking at what comes up regularly often examiners talk about that in their reflection so if you haven't been on the nessa website like if you just type in they say for chemistry chemistry 2021 hse exam pack you'll be able to go on there and i don't know if, can i share my screen uh, um i, I can stop sharing boot, boot you out for a second oh yeah um, you've been booted out perfect but you sh can you see my screen there yes we can yeah. yeah cool so you can see here if you go if this is the chemistry one the exam pack you've got the papers you've got the marking guidelines um same on ed roller we all have those marking guidelines with you know presenters going through those guidelines and helping you unpack them all as well. Uh, but you can click down here and it's got all the feedback. So for every question after the multiple choice, 
And it's got things that students um, were better at doing and things they needed to improve on. So this might even act as a bit of a checklist for you going through here and going, can I do these things that they've suggested students need to improve on? Um, and you'll be able to see, sometimes they talk about things that commonly come up and common issues that um, students have. So that can be a real sort of detailed way to um, refine how you're going and check where you're at as well. All right, well, we are a little bit over time. So some great questions coming through there. And there's a few more questions around, can you show me this slide again? And that um, I'm going to uh, send you guys the recording plus the slides so you can look back and see whatever you need. We'll put in some of those links to the YouTube videos and some of those other resources that uh, Zoe mentioned as well. So it'll be in an email that I'll um, get out to you tomorrow. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I really hope you found it useful. Zoe, thank you so much. Um, you've done a fantastic job. And I think there's yeah, so much, as I said before, so much gold in there that's going to support these guys. I mean, not only their trial exams coming up, but then their HSE exams a little further down the track. So hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and look out for the email coming your way shortly. Thanks, guys. And thank you for all the messages.